Joining me now on the Knicks Film School pregame show, friend of the pod, first time he's back here since we uh, tried to convince him to take on Julius Randle, and then Julius Randle turned out <laughs> to be somebody we don't want to just salary dump to another team for Russell Westbrook. Uh, he covers the Los Angeles Lakers, but I'm just going to throw this out there real quick. If you're a fan of The Last of Us, you need to sub- sub- subscribe to his podcast, The Last of Us Nerds. Um, I have yet to watch episode three at time of recording, and yet by the time you will have listened to this, I will most likely have watched The Last of Us uh, episode three. Uh, but ner- all that stuff aside, we're basketball nerds here on this podcast, and we're oh, yeah. also going to talk about the, the Lakers against the Knicks. He is a writer for uh, SB Nation, um, the Lakers screen and roll. Um, and he joins me today to talk about the Knicks preview against the Lakers, uh, Knicks game against the Lakers. Excuse me. Jacob Brood, welcome back to the Knicks Film School podcast. You said you guys aren't willing to dump Julius Randle anymore. I will still have more. <laughs> yeah. I, Russell Westbrook is still happily available if you guys want him. The 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 price of the brick has gone up to, uh, to quote Marlo <laughs> from the wire. Uh, I. <laughs> It's one of the revelations of this season is what Julius Randle has turned himself into and his value. And I look, I'm curious about the rust thing. And I'm going to like it's on my list of things to talk about. But I guess I'll just start here. The vibes in Los Angeles. I mean, that's a complicated question after the entire sport rallied around a non foul call um, over the weekend. But like Russ goes to the bench. He's the front runner for sixth man of the year. The Lakers being at time of recording 23 and 27. I should mention that too. We're, this is the first time I'm recording one of these, Jacob, before where, where a game will have been played by the team that my my co-host for the day uh, is is playing. I think I said that correctly. The Lakers play the Nets tonight. We are recording around 1 p.m. on Monday. The Lakers will play the Nets before they play the Knicks. So we're previewing a game, and yet the Lakers will play a game before the Knicks play that game. There, I explained that correctly. So barring anything crazy tonight in the Nets game, and the Lakers made this really easy for me by sitting LeBron and AD in Brooklyn, um, this should be okay. But obviously, I'll, I'll record something to, to fix it. If not... Um, the vibes in Los Angeles, the Lakers are 23 and 27, which isn't a great record, but they have one fewer loss, I think, or a couple fewer losses than the four seed in the West. How are you feeling about the team? How's the fan base feeling? Is this like where we're treading water and the trade deadlines coming or is this a disappointment? Uh, a little, little Little of A, little of B. Uh, it's definitely, tr- it was treading water without Anthony Davis. He's been back a couple of games. Uh, he came back for the Spurs game last week and then played in that Boston game over the weekend. Look, when AD went down, <laughs> there were f- alarms going off and sirens, and it, it looked like it was going to be bad because he was playing at a MVP level and we were bad. So like when he went down, it it felt like, Oh no, this could get really bad. The Lakers actually moved up in the playoff race after he went down, which Hmm. a lot of this is a testament to how bad the Western conference is uh, because they are uh, four games under 500 and two losses back of the five seed. So the Western conference is a train wreck and the Lakers are benefiting from that because in most scenarios, being 23 and 27 would not have you a couple games out of almost home court in the uh, playoffs. So that's been something the Lakers have benefited from this season. Uh, the uh, The hope was to tread water until AD got back and LeBron and him would be able to, to carry them back up into the playoff race. It's only been a couple games. They're not playing on Monday against Brooklyn. And so it's... Uh, We're still not certain if that's going to be the case, but that's the plan. It was to just kind of evaluate this team once LeBron and AD got back and make the final, any final trades or moves or anything like that to get them what they, what they need and what the Lakers are willing to give up to, to try to get this team into the playoffs. But it's been a, it's been a weird year, man. It feels like it's been 50 games and it feels like it's been 150 games. It feels like there's been, three separate seasons in this one. Cause we had LeBron and AD. Then we didn't have LeBron. Then we didn't have AD. It's uh, it's been a long year and it's not even to the all-star break. It's funny. I, 
the Knicks fans and and how passionately we cover this team, I think the only thing I would put above it is Lakers fans and how yeah. passionately the Lakers are covered because it's the, the Knicks are very much a local um team, but like they're Knicks fans everywhere. I liken them to the Cowboys to that stance where they're very much Texas's team, but they're Cowboy fans everywhere. Yeah. The Lakers you'll find there are plenty of Laker fans in New York. There are Laker fans around the world. So that type of attention to this team um, will probably add to the heat that I'm sure the front office is feeling oh, yeah. over the next few weeks. How have you, well, that makes you probably be able to tell me better from what the reporting has been, and I guess how much heat the fan base might be putting on the Lakers front office. They, they have to make a deal. In the next week or so, right? Like they, th- there's no way LeBron can sign this extension. The West can be this, I'll just say it wide open. And the Lakers just kind of go with like, we traded for Rui Hachimura. We're good. You say that I say that, but the front office has just uh, stood pat. Largely speaking, they traded for Rui, which came out of nowhere, but um, it, that was kind of the worry is that that came out of nowhere. There wasn't any indication that they were closing in on a deal or anything. They've just been kind of standing pat and looking at this roster and kind of determining it's not good enough to go all in with trading Russ and picks. And then you're left trying to improve on the margins and those types of deals are everybody's looking for those types of deals. So they're hard to, to pull off. So uh, I really like the Rui deal, but yeah, I would I would think that they need to make another uh, change because they still have way too many guards and no wing players. So, but again, everybody's looking for wing players on the trade market. So, I do think that they need to make another trade. And if they do another, if they pull off a trade similar to what they did with Rui, I do think that this could be a solid playoff team, assuming full health, which with the Lakers, the last couple seasons, you can't really assume that, but I do think this could be a playoff team. And as you said, LeBron is playing out of his mind this season and he did it last year as well. And it felt like we wasted a year of LeBron. Then I can't imagine sitting back and doing the same thing again this year, but the Lakers front office has, they fans have put a ton of heat, on the Lakers front office and they've just sat there and absorbed it all. And it hasn't changed how they've approached anything. They didn't panic when the Lakers were two and 10, the Lakers got, I think to a game within 500 and they didn't kind of capitalize on that or anything like that. They've just been the same steady, even keel, no matter what the highs or lows have been this season, which is probably good when you're a good team, but when you're a bad team, it doesn't feel as uh, good of an approach. Why did LeBron sign the extension? Like I, the, all, my my guess and my assumption on the outside looking in is that they were going to trade those two picks. He got some type of confirmation or or guarantee from the front office. Like, hey, we will we will do what we can to try and win and win regardless of long term, you know, um, success in in the future. Um, we're going to try and win this season and it is January 30th and there is less than, <laughs> less than 10 days until the deadline. Um, so I, I mean, when he signed, what was your thought? A surprise that he didn't kind of, I don't want to say hold the front office hostage, but it was what he did in Cleveland where he would do, he would kind of have the threat of, I'm going to leave if you don't one plus make ones. This, yeah. Yeah. If you don't make this team better, I'm going to leave. And I just thought, well, we're set for that, which isn't bad. I mean, we still have LeBron and the team did need to improve, but he signed the deal and I was I was in the same boat. I thought, well, this means that the the team's going to trade the picks. LeBron's in on all those conversations as much as he claims to the media. He's not. He's he's made privy to all those conversations. And Rob Polinka came out on uh, media day at the start of the season and said, Like we're aware we have these picks and we're going to make a move to improve the roster. And as the season has went along, it's been, well, we're only going to do it for an all-star and well, we're only going to do it if it makes us a title contender. And then most recently after they traded for Rui, it was, Oh, we're only going to do it if it makes us a title front runner. And it's like, it's getting further and further away from us trading those picks. So LeBron signed the extension. I thought with kind of a handshake agreement of, We'll do so. We'll we'll improve this roster. He's voiced his frustration that the they haven't improved this roster. 
I mean, I also think he signed the extension because he likes living in L.A. and his family seems very settled in L.A. So the Lakers are benefiting from that. But the Lakers are also like it feels like they're kind of testing what they can get away with with LeBron, which is not a game that you want to play, because if it goes bad, then you look really, really bad in this scenario. So they're they're making those incremental improvements, but I don't think at this point they're going to trade the two first round picks and Russ for anything. There isn't much on the market left, and then they just have shown complete unwillingness to to really do that this season. So this is part of a couple of LeBron questions that I have. Um, I mean, good lord, the the way he's playing, and and look, like it's it's. I'm sure you have heard and and covered this and been part of the the marvel of what he's doing at this age with as many miles as he has. I should also mention he's 116 points away from the all-time scoring record behind uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, we were tracking it here at Knicks Film School to see if he would be able to do it at the Garden. And unless he scores 117 points <laughs> on Tuesday, which, look, not going to put it past him to do it. Yeah. Uh, he obviously will not be doing it. Um, how much has that been able to not necessarily cover up the Lakers struggles this year, but you know, JJ Redick had that take that this season shouldn't be about like, can he get his fifth ring? It should be about marveling his greatness while he, he goes after the title, almost like, you know, the I'm here in New York with there's these two years in the 2010s with the Yankees where they didn't make the playoffs but like one year was Derek Jeter's last season. The other year was Mariano's last season. So it didn't matter technically because we were celebrating this one person's career. Um, is that, have, has that been able to be part of it at all? Is, has his chase of this record helped people get over the fact that this team's not very good? Not really. Uh, we not did at this all. With, okay. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, we did this with Kobe. Mm. That was a really bad team. And Kobe was very much on his last legs there. And that masked over it. I don't know if LeBron maybe not doesn't have the same kind of pull in Los Angeles. It, it, it I will say when AD went down in mid December, LeBron really just kicked it up a gear. And so I would say from maybe mid-December to where we are now, there's been a lot more marveling because he's just doing absurd things right now. And we're it, it's it's more, like I said earlier, it's more watching him and thinking, damn, we can't really waste this again, can we? Like, we can't really not give him the the contending team that, that he deserves. So I, I, as the record has kind of gotten closer and closer, I think more and more people are are starting to just, like you said, marvel and just appreciate what we're watching. It, it's hard to put into words. I've said this a couple of times, whether on our podcast, whether in writing that like I'm kind of I'm obviously paid to write and cover and say things about this team. And I've run out of just superlatives for LeBron like a long mm-hmm. time ago. I did because he just keeps doing things that just don't feel like it should be possible in year 20 in at his age at it, it's just it's unfathomable and so it in that regard i think laker fans have been feeling this way about him dating back to last year when he had his best scoring season ever maybe and he's following it up with a better one just in terms of sheer volume i think last year was the the most points he ever averaged in a season it was like in 55 games or something but mm-hmm. uh it was it was the second most last year and he's right on that pace this year so like we've been marveling for a little bit but i think laker fans also want to marvel at him being atop the western conference then marveling at him trying to get into a playing game because we watched it last year where he was going insane trying to carry this team and then uh they didn't even make the playing game so like i I think that uh there's i don't want to say there's a limit to what they're marveling but just they want more for him like there's almost a sense of like he shouldn't have to do this for us to be i mean as we're recording we're two games out of the play in race like and he's playing at an insane level so it's more frustration i would say than anything else that he's doing this he should be competing for titles and we're competing for the 10 spot in the play in race right now well to your point though from earlier because of how jumbled the middle yeah. of the West is and that middle, I mean, it goes from 
I mean, Sacramento will put that as a cutoff. So you have the top three and the bottom two. The the mid from four to thirteen is so jumbled that yes, they're two games out of the play-in race. But like, look look at Minnesota, a, a simple little three-game winning streak. They're the five seed, you know, yeah. like a four-game winning streak for the Lakers, and suddenly they're sixth. Yeah, that's just like how this season has gone in the Western Conference. I, let me before I get to some AD questions, the way he's played this year, and then obviously the way AD has played this season. Do, what's the move that you think that would make them not necessarily a title contender? I guess I'll ask a title contender. And I guess and more more specifically, is there a move that you're eyeing that would make it so that way the Lakers are now a title contender? Or let me just put this moves as well. Yeah, I would I would agree with the sentiment that a winning streak gets them into that and maybe the feeling is different. Mm-hmm. They haven't done that what you've done that yet. So like it, it's a lot of what if and maybes. If they do do it and they move up and then they kind of slide back down and maybe we can it would be a different feeling. But through the whole season we've just been looking up at the standings and thinking, oh well if we just do a, or have a winning streak, we'll move into the the race. And we haven't been in the play in <laughs> since like the very, very beginning of the season. So mm-hmm. it, it's been that might be like kind of clouding our, our takes a little bit. It's just we've been looking up the whole season and thinking, man, it's so close. What if when we haven't been there, part of that has been because of a pretty flawed roster that I think was pretty clearly built with the expectation of a rush trade before the season started with so many guards on the roster. And then the trade wasn't made depending on who you believe, what report you believe, the the deal with the Pacers for Buddy Heald and Miles Turner could have been as close as the one-yard line. Uh, I think Dave McMiniman said that there were people within the Lakers' office that um, they went on a break before the season started, and the expectation was they were going to come back and Miles and Buddy were going to be Lakers. The Pacers kind of refute how close that was, but mm. regardless, it was very close to being done, and... I mean, in an ideal world, obviously, in hindsight, that looks like an incredible deal. I That's, I think, far off the table now. So uh, if we are looking, I don't know that there's like a, a move necessarily that or even multiple moves that, that takes him that high. I mean, Bogdanovich and Detroit, just his archetype is exactly, I think, what the Lakers need. But Detroit is holding out for quite a lot in return for him. And they should. I mean, they have no urgency to necessarily trade him right now. Right. Um, It's those types of deals that the Lakers are kind of eyeing, but I mean, everybody on the market wants a six, seven, six, eight, three point specialist. So like it's going to come at a high price. I don't know that the Lakers are willing to pay that when they only have a couple picks they can trade and they're still going to be, even if they make that trade and even if the, things go well, there's still going to be a three or four seed and only have home court maybe for a round or two. And I, I don't know if that's something they're willing to do. What they really need is is some shooting and more than anything, just depth on the wing. Both, both those things are highly coveted in the trade market, so they're just not easy to come around. So it's hard to I, – I don't even know off the top of my head who – who else they would be targeting? I mean, they were targeting Cam Reddish forever. That's why I was waiting for the, the Cam conversation to start. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, they were targeting Cam Reddish forever. It sounds like they've backed off on that a little bit after trading for Rui. But I was going to say, I think they chose Rui over Cam, is how yeah. we read it, at least. Yeah, because they really only had two contracts they could trade straight up for Cam Reddish. One of them was Kendrick Nunn, who they dealt. The other one was Lonnie Walker, who's been really good this season for them. So... There's still ways they could do it. It would just take other contracts and multiple players, and it gets a little more complicated at that point. But I mean, Cam, Red- I guess the idea of what Cam Reddish is as a three point wing, three point specialist on the wing is what they need. They thought Cam Reddish could be the new Malik Monk or Lonnie Walker, kind of this maybe misused type of guy or miscast type of guy that they think that they can fix. But as you said, they ultimately chose Rui over over Cam. Yeah, the very important distinction you made of the idea of yes. Cam Reddish being um, and look, I he is a a highly and heavily debated uh, topic here <laughs> uh, in New York. And I mean, look to 
to to to throw the the cam high of a bone, I was intrigued by what this player could be, and just to give you a little behind the scenes. And our listeners have heard this, so I apologize to them. Um, he started the season with no no role. Ended up playing a ton on an opening night. Hit a three pointer against Memphis to send it into overtime. And it was like, all right, I guess Cam is part of the thing, like part of the solution right now. Um, then uh, Quentin Grimes got healthy. He had missed the first couple games of the season. Uh, and while Evan Fournier was initially taken out of the rotation for Cam, then Cam lost his starting spot to Quentin Grimes, who has been the Knicks' like point of attack, a, a, a defender all season. You'll see a lot of him against LeBron mm-hmm. um, on, on Tuesday. Uh, and as Cam's minutes started to get less because he's coming off the bench in a Thibodeau system, he just got banished. And while I personally I agree that it's more the idea of Cam that I think is more intriguing than the actual player Cam Reddish is, I also don't like they've they, they've gone with Deuce McBride over him for the past uh, month and a half. And while the results you can argue are there. I also think they could use some playmaking in the second unit and a second chance would actually absolutely be warranted. Our suspicion is that there's been an agreement between player, coach, agent, GM, front office that he will not play until he's on yeah. another team, which look, I, I don't expect Cam Reddish to be here after next <laughs> Thursday. So that this, I'm also surprised that like when the Lakers deal eventually at Gonesy, when Woj sent out that tweet of the Lakers have acquired. I was expecting to see Cam Reddish's name yeah. in that deal, um, but we'll obviously see. Um, DeRozan is that like so? If I can get a little, a little crazy with you, so like the DeRozan Vooch package that Zach Lowe mentioned before the season, or um, some other type of deals that were it's a legitimate number three guy, or even you know you could argue with the injury questions with with AD the the number two guy potentially. Um, is that at all being discussed seriously in Lakerland? <clears throat> there is a, I think, a trade target from the Bulls, but I don't think it's DeRozan and Vucevic at this point. So it's Levine. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And it, it wasn't really something that we gave a lot of credence to, but I mean, speaking about Zach Lowe and back to back podcasts, he's mentioned that that being a deal that the Lakers are kind of eyeing and whether the Bulls would actually pull the trigger on it. And even like even speculation from Zach Lowe probably has some type of inf- information behind it. So it, it's kind of perked our ears up a bit. Like, wait a second. Uh, hold mm-hmm. on. That, that might be something. Damar and Vucevic, that might have been something at the beginning of the season. Damar really, really, really wants to be a Laker. And that really drives everything kind of around that discussion. I have uh, the one of the last times I wrote about him, me and my editor – we're discussing how many times we've written about DeMar DeRozan talking about wanting to be a Laker or like how close he was to being a Laker. And this dates back to like 2016. He's from LA, Mm -hmm. grew up a Lakers fan. He loves, he loves the Lakers. He really wants to be a Laker, but it just hasn't worked out for a number of reasons. And wasn't it real quick. Wasn't it also him on JJ Reddick's pod where he said he thought he was going to be a Laker that he like went on vacation right before free agency with the idea that when he came back, he'd be a Laker. And while he was on vacation, he saw the rest trade happen and was like, Oh, I guess I'm not going to be a Laker, you know? Yeah. And I mean, to his point, it seems like everybody was kind of blindsided by that rust trade because it, I mean, the Kings certainly, the story that came out most recently is that, uh, the Lakers told Montrez Harrell to opt into his contract so that they could trade him to the Kings. And in the time it literally took him to fax the paperwork into the league office, the Lakers changed their mind and said, we're going to do the rust deal instead. So mm. like the headline was if Trez had a quicker fax machine, then buddy healed would be a Laker right now instead of, instead of Russ. But it was, yeah, that whole summer, there was a lot of, ifs and maybes and nearlies and whatnot. And DeMar was among them. Um, and I, f- yeah, I found the list. It dates back to May of 2016 when there were links between DeMar and uh, the Lakers. And as you said, on the JJ Reddick podcast, he, he said he thought it was a done deal that he was going to the Lakers and he can't stop talking <laughs> about the Lakers basically. <laughs> so uh, it it's always going to be kind of that trade out there. I don't think the Lakers are 
are really considering it. Um, it, it never really got more than like, well, could this make sense? And that was at the beginning of the season. And the Lakers have been watching the Bulls. I don't think it's necessarily for DeMar and Vucevic, though. I think it's for Zach Levine, who also mm-hmm. made some comments about being a Lakers fan. And, and I think he or he went to UCLA. So, like, there's a connection there and whatnot. So, uh, I don't know how bad things are going to get in Chicago. I don't. It doesn't seem like they're in blow it up territory. So, uh, it, it it not yet at least. I, I'm they're in the ten seed. Maybe a, a couple more games than they are, but there is a name in Chicago. It just wouldn't. I don't think it's Demar Derozan at this point. It depends who you ask in Chicago. We had a uh, uh, Jason Pat on um, who who covers the Bulls and. Uh, the Knicks had this weird home and not not home and home. It was a road and road. So they played in Chicago on Wednesday and then played in Chicago again on Friday. And we had Jason on on the Thursday and we asked him about like blow it up mode. And he was like, it would take like a second loss to the to the Knicks and then maybe some more losses in order for me to get into blow it up mode, let alone the blow it up mode then happened. Um, well, at least that, those losses started to happen. Like you said, they're not. They're not in a position whether I'm looking at it now. They're 23 and 26. That's fixable. The yeah. thing that I think is why people keep going to putting them in a blow it up mode situation is because of the pick protections with Orlando. Um, they need, I believe, to finish top five is the pick protections with Orlando top four. So there's like a pivot to be the top to have a, a six, a top six or I should say bottom six record. And so like as a Knicks fan, I've been on Caruso and I'm sure, you know, the, the oh, value yeah. that our Alex Caruso oh, yeah. can bring, it's, especially. It's as so, so let me, I don't want to open up this wound, but like that off season <laughs> potentially being like, so it would have been buddy healed that came back healed and Barnes yeah, that came yeah. back from the Kings. It would have been buddy. I can't remember the exact deal. It would have been built around buddy for, Kuzma and Trez, I think. And I don't, I'm not sure if KCP was involved or not, but it would have been basically Kuzma and Trez for Buddy as like the, the main pieces to it. Kuzma would also be very good on the Lakers right now, but I oh, think yeah. Trez, he's another name that, that is, he may come back. He may, I don't know. He was, he was kind of trolling everyone when he came back to LA. They played the Clippers and Lakers back to back and, I, I can't remember the exact tweet he sent, but they got off the plane. He goes, man, I really love this LA weather and stuff like that. So he was, uh, he's been adding fuel to the fire, but it, it sounds like he's staying in Washington after they dealt Rui. So there's a world that the Lakers play their cards. I don't want to say right, because a lot of these deals we're doing with hindsight, but there's a world where say you make the Kings trade, buddy healed is, is your third or your, your, whatever you're stretched to uh, your, your three and D guy. That is the perfect wing in a LeBron system that can hit threes. Um, you have enough money then to sign Caruso and then you get DeRozan, And then that's your five. It's 80 LeBron DeRozan Caruso, but he healed. It, it, uh, I was trying to look up to see what the trade for buddy was. I, it would have been either buddy or DeRozan based on how so it was the, one the or the other. Okay. Worked. Yeah, it would have been because Kuzma was basically the guy that they were kind of shopping as the main piece and trying to get back either buddy. If he would have went, if we would have got DeRozan, it would have been Kuzma uh, going to San Antonio. So it would have been one of Buddy or DeRozan and Caruso with the rest of the core the Lakers had. Well, that leads perfectly into my next question because what ended up happening is Russell Westbrook came to the <laughs> Lakers and last season was what it was. And so, again, it's tough to talk about what he's been this year because admittedly, he's been better off the bench than he was detrimental in the starting five last season. I'm impressed with how Darvin Han handled that situation. But... I mean, you tell me, is it still like this player should not be on this team if they're trying to win a championship? Or, you know, is there actually a world where you could see them making more tertiary moves? Like you said, just going and getting like a, a third guy that doesn't replace Westbrook on on the roster and you can actually use him as a six man. Uh, so 
I don't think that you can win in the playoffs with him, but the Lakers seem to have moved past the idea of trading him. Okay. Um, it, it The situation is substantially better than what it was. I mean, I remember when I came on here last time and we were talking about like, where is Russ on opening night? Cause I didn't mm-hmm. think he was going to be on the Lakers and I didn't think he was going to be anywhere. Like it was really bad. And just the idea of him accepting a role off the bench felt so foreign. Like it, mm-hmm. it wasn't even a plausible scenario. It didn't seem like it started great because they tried it once in the preseason. And then Russ had this like mysterious hamstring injury that kept him out of the, he's like, he like came into the game. And he's like, Oh, my hamstring, I can't play. And it was like, Oh wow. Is this what it's going to be like now? To your, as you said, Darvin Ham handled this magnificently with Russ and got him to buy into coming off the bench. If you look statistically, he's been almost worse than last season, but the <laughs> vibes are better. Uh-huh. So it's kind of this trade off of do you want uh, what we had last year where the vibes were awful and the Lakers were bad, or do you want this year where He's not shooting as well, either from the field, from three. He's shooting equally as bad from the field. Might be assisting a little bit more, but that's really about it. But the vibes feel a lot better. Like It doesn't feel like everything's about to blow up at any given second. So that's just kind of been the trade-off. The Lakers, the vibes have been good enough to where the Lakers have backed off the idea of trading him. And... It it seems like now we're going to head into the offseason as a cap space team and just have him come off the books, which is a a drastic turnaround from three, four, five months ago before the season. Even during the summer last year, it was multiple times it felt like when he gets traded, not if he gets traded. So Russ deserves a lot of credit for accepting this role and embracing it. And it will probably prolong his career a couple of years if he's willing to do this in other stops because he does have some value as this. I mean, he comes on as kind of this energy point guard that gets up and down the floor and runs. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of what people wanted him to be for a couple of years and just accepting this fly up and down the court, be this super crazy energy guy and, and Excel. He finally did it. And he's finding more success there. And it just doesn't feel as bad as it did last season. Last season, it felt like just it's hard to even really put a finger on just what it felt like last year because he wasn't succeeding. And then he was blaming everyone and the Lakers were pointing fingers at him. And it was just like this really messy situation. And this year. He's not playing as well, but I guess people aren't pointing their finger at him as much because he's now the sixth man and isn't playing as much. And it may be just as simple as that. Hmm. It's not great that you have your sixth man as he's making the most money on the team this year. So it's not great that your sixth man is kind of good in certain matchups and making the most money. But the, they made the best of a, a really bad situation so far this year, at least. Which, you know, credit to credit to Russ, like you said, credit to the coach, as we said. Um, yeah, I I also was surprised that they didn't trade him and like that he's still yeah. on the Lakers. And it seems like they're going to go the cap space route with how, look, maybe the Kyrie thing is is still possible, but I, I am unsure how the Lakers will be able to use their cap space um, to improve the roster, at least not with one big star maybe yeah. it, it's it's similar to a couple of years ago where they just signed like a bunch of guys and it led to the title team that we saw in the bubble um which in the bubble a guy named Anthony Davis played out of his mind and yeah. and led to a title uh so to give you a little backstory and a couple more before I let you go um we obviously the Knicks had the summer of Donovan Mitchell that didn't turn into Donovan Mitchell and then it pivoted to, well, who's the guy they're going to trade for? And AD, because of the Kentucky connection, because of um, the, the what comes with the territory of being a player next to LeBron James, that you're always potentially expendable. Um, the the uh, the rumors, I know Simmons has floated it out there, Bill Simmons, that like the Knicks may end up going, the, the all-in trade might be for, for AD instead. Um, 
the reaction, at least from our audience, was like, no way, don't want to do it. He's too injury prone. And what we said was like, at least what I said, was I hear you on the availability. As far as ability is concerned, he's off to one of the best starts in his career this year. If we're just talking on the court, then I absolutely would go all in on Anthony Davis, especially since like the other option that keeps getting thrown out is Embiid. Something I can't have questions about Embiid's <laughs> availability and health history. Um, it's a two-part question, but like, has his on-court play at least made it so that like there's no frustration in in having him be the second guy? You know that like you know that at least when we get him back. Despite how much of a risk it's been, he'll be he'll be you know the legit one of the top seven guys in the NBA when he plays. And then there's the obvious, you know, looking over what's going on in New Orleans. How much is it almost important for him to come back and help this team get out of the 13th spot? So that way, this pick that goes to New Orleans, you know, isn't as good as it could possibly be. Shout out to the Pelicans for I think they're one and nine in their last ten and making us feel a lot better. I was about to yeah, say the, the is it a swap were, this like, year or oh, is it a regular pick? It's a swap. So it's uh, a, oh, so there's a world where there might not even be a swap. Okay, that's actually not bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because there was a point I think around that like two and ten start where they were like the one seed and we were oh, like yeah. the, we were like the like fifteenth seed in the West and it was like oh god we're gonna give them a lottery pick or like a, a top five pick and mm-hmm. be at the back end of the draft. Shout out to them for making us not mm-hmm. feel as awful about that, but it's still a long season. AD, it's such a. Uh, it's such an interesting debate. I don't even know what the right word is because to me, he came in, we win a title. Like it doesn't matter what, like the trade was worth it. Like you won a title and it's like that discussion is done, but the, (laughs) we're going to owe them picks until 2026. So like the discussion isn't actually going to stop regardless of whether it was already kind of done or worth it or anything like that. And the fact that, he had he hadn't really played well since he played in the bubble. It it was largely due to injuries, and um, I mean that there was such a quick turnaround after that bubble season that he just very clearly wasn't in shape that year, and then gets hurt and whatnot. So there was a lot of Lakers fans just kind of upset that it we saw bubble AD, and then where did that go? Like mm-hmm. it, it just wasn't around. What we saw at the beginning of this year was like at least even to what bubble AD was, it was, there was a stretch where he was just one of the best players in the league. And like I said, playing at an MVP level, it's just so frustrating because when he gets hurt, it never feels like, like it last year, he landed on like Rudy Gobert's ankle and looked like he snapped his ankle. And it's just like, how do you prevent that? Yeah. This year it was like, (laughs) it was this wild sequence where, he had a bone spur in his foot that was rubbing against the bone and he just like jumped and the way he jumped actually fractured the bone spur. So like he goes in to get testing and it took them a week to do testing because what they found out is that like he had multiple injuries where he had this fractured bone spur, but it had been rubbing against his foot and nearly causing a stress re- like fracture there. And it was like, well, like how would you ever prevent that? Like it, right. he said that the bone spur dated back to his time at Kentucky. So like it was, hmm. it, it's just these things where it's like, it's really frustrating that he's not available, but it's always these really freak occurrences that it doesn't feel like are preventable. And so, but him playing as well as he did at the beginning of this season, it was like, It was there was no more discussion like the trade was worth it. He was one of the best players in the in the league. He was carrying the team without LeBron at the time. Uh, The Lakers were going on a win streak and it was fantastic. He's come back and uh, I mean, his first game, he all things considered, he was on it. He was on a minutes restriction and looked great. It was a little bit tougher against Boston, but I mean, Boston's one of the, the best teams in the league right now. So it, it was a jump in competitiveness level. Um, we'll see if he can get back to that form. But it, like you said, there's always going to be kind of these questions hanging over LeBron's number two and whether they're going to move that guy or not. 
I don't think it's ever been serious that they ever considered trading him. Mm. And it, they've had reports basically come out saying that like, he's not available. They're not trading him. LeBron and, and Rich Paul worked hard to get him here. And I think as long as LeBron's here, he's not going anywhere. What happens post LeBron we'll see, but I mean, it certainly doesn't seem like LeBron's slowing down anytime either. So I, I think it's going to be LeBron and AD for a while. And it, if AD is healthy, at least, I mean, he's, he's shown he can be really good, but I, I mean, it feels like AD's career is going to be when he was healthy, dot, dot, dot. Mm-hmm. That's a crazy reality, by the way, that yeah. the, the, the post LeBron and we have no idea when that's going to be, <laughs> yeah, you know, like he signed this extension. And it was like a two year extension. It was like, all right, well, that'll get him to when he's playing with Bronny and maybe it'll, he'll have a year or two then. And now it's like, he made a reference that he m- wants to also play with his next son mm-hmm. after that. And that's like another three years. And it doesn't even seem that far fetched at this point. It doesn't. No, I mean, look at different sports, but when you look at what Brady and Aaron Rodgers are doing, yeah. Um, I, and yet I even I even say that I'm like, no, that's standing in a pocket. This is running up and down a court at, at full speed, especially yeah. the the type of play that uh, that LeBron has. Um, yeah, I'm I'm curious to to see what happens with the Lakers. And before I let you go, as far as this game is concerned between the Knicks and the Lakers, I I've been starting to wrap up each of these conversations by asking a what's your perspective, what's going on with the Knicks this season. And then, you know, how going in as far as expectations are concerned, do you, how do you feel about the Knicks, the, the Lakers chances against the Knicks on Tuesday? I, I feel like the Knicks are probably a lot like the Lakers where it just feels like the highs are really high and the lows are, are really Oh my low. gosh. The mea culpa that happens after every loss. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, the system's broken. Fire Tibbs. They're granted the fire Tibbs thing is in every win as well. But, <laughs> um, the, the fact that it, the, the highs have been fun and this, this young core that they've built, like Julius Randle is the oldest in the rotation right now. And the found money that they have with Jalen Brunson has been incredible to see. And like Emmanuel quickly is on a rookie contract and the, the the back-to-back 25th picks in the draft with Quentin Grimes and Emmanuel quickly. It's like, Oh, wow. So they, they, we don't know how much they know what they're doing, but they do clearly know a little bit about what they're doing. Um, But yes, the highs have been, very high but with the lows leading to an Armageddon. Yeah. And that's yeah. exactly how it is with the Lakers. When, like mm. they can't even win normally. Like the, the win against the Blazers, like a little over a week ago where they gave up an absurd, like 35 point, like second quarter, they got outscored by 35 and then won the damn game. Like <laughs> it, it's just, it doesn't feel like anything can be normal with this franchise. Um, yeah, and that's when I when I look at the Knicks, I'm like, that's that feels like how the situation is in in LA, where everything feels like it's uh, either the worst thing ever, or the best thing ever, and there's there's not a lot of in between. I always well, and I know I speak for a lot of Lakers fans. We'll always have a soft spot for Julius Randle, so like mm. I will always pay attention to him and, and see how he's doing. And I, I end up rooting for the Knicks just because of that, because I want to see Julius Randle have success. So uh, it's always a, a fun matchup to see. And LeBron loves playing in Madison Square Garden. I don't know that he's going to score 117, uh, but <laughs> I, I wouldn't say no necessarily. But no, I it, it would have been really cool. We've obviously been tracking this uh, when he's going to break the record. And it obviously would have been just the, for the pageantry of it to do it in Madison square garden would have been really cool. Selfishly. I live in Indiana and they play the Pacers on Thursday. Ah, and it, was, okay. it was this close. If he doesn't miss like two or three games, he would have done it. So I would have liked to see it then. It looks like he's probably going to do it back home next week. They have a couple of uh, home games. It could come against the Bucks. That's who, the thing. I think they're aiming for the Bucks game, so it comes yeah. against Kareem's old team. Yeah, yeah. and there is some uh, some poetry to that, and th- that I kind of wrote about that. I don't know that. I don't think that they necessarily sat him on Monday because of that, because he hasn't. He's been iffy on playing back to backs, and I think it was just. I, he would rather play an MSG than mm-hmm. the Barclay Center or whatever it is. And so um, I think that was as much of a calculation. But also it changed when he was going to break the record from a road game against the Pelicans to at home against OKC, which 
I'm sure they didn't hate. I'm sure that he and everybody involved with the Lakers would rather him do it in Staples Center. So, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be it, it's always fun to watch LeBron. He loves getting up for a big stage and playing in MSG. It's going to be fun. I'm excited for it. Call me a conspiracy theorist, but I absolutely think that they sat him against Brooklyn because of yeah. their their factoring in when he'll break the record, and it's why. I am looking at that Saturday against New Orleans and also thinking you might not play that. <laughs> um, it, it, it's close enough now to where you can very much like calculate, like he can make a couple decisions and be like, all right, we're going to, we're going to do it here. We're going to do it there. I don't think he'd ever get in a game and be like, all right, I'm not going to score now because, right. but well, like you can know beforehand, like, do I think I can score, you know, 47 against the Pelicans or should I, sit this one out and I have two home games. I think he'll get a little heavy handed because yeah, there's certain play. Like I think if it was close, he would have done it in MSG just because it's, I mean, there's a story there, but like, Mm -hmm. does he want to do it in like bankers life field house in Indianapolis? Yeah, no, probably not. Like he, there's certain places I think, and especially with how close it is to LA, like, or to being in LA that, yeah, it, it, it certainly was like when I, we've had the calculations and when I updated it after he sat, I was like, ah, well it's back home now. So like that makes sense. So I, I would buy into a conspiracy theory that he might've set this game out intentionally to, to break the record at home. I'm, I'm just, I'm wondering how it's a TNT game. So the the country gets to watch it. Oh, that yeah. Bucks game I've had circled for like a week and a half. Like, okay, he's probably not going to do it at MSG. And, and look, it's also why when I saw that he was sitting against Brooklyn, it almost confirmed a theory I was already working on that, that they're aiming for that to be the day um, for him to actually break the record. But look, the way LeBron's playing, I'm not putting it past him to to beat it at MSG tomorrow night because of how, how well he's playing. Watch him just tell all say, of us. There's still like four games hell, between, you know? now, between now and then. So like... It, like you said, how he's playing, he mm-hmm. might have to sit a couple games on this road trip. That's why I'm staring at that New Orleans game, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, don't be surprised if that's a oh source something. AKA, yeah. I want to break it against the Bucks. Um, <laughs> Jacob, you've been great with your time. I don't wish you luck in the game tomorrow night, <laughs> but I wish you enjoyment watching the game. Uh, do me a favor, tell everybody where they can find you and your stuff, as well as your Last of Us podcast on the internet. Yeah, absolutely. You can follow me at Jacob Rude. All the the Lakers work is at Silver Screen and Roll for SB Nation. And then the Last of Us Nerds podcast is something we just launched launched with the start of this with the HBO series. It's been phenomenal, and it, it's a a passion project that we enjoy. Weekly episode, just kind of recapping the the series. And I encourage everyone to go watch it. It's a it's an incredible series. Co-sign on the show, co-sign on the podcast as well. Jacob, thank you as always, my man. Yeah, anytime.